أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والمحصنات من النساء إلا ما ملكت أيمانكم كتاب الله عليكم وأحل لكم ما وراء ذلكم أن تبتغوا بأموالكم أن تبتغوا بأموالكم محصنين غير مسافحين فما استمتعتم به منهن فآتوهن أجورهن فريضة ولا جناه عليكم فيما تراضيتم به من بعد الفريضة إن الله كان عليما حكيما الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has given us the enablement to start with the fifth juz Surah An-Nisa, it's a continuation of Surah An-Nisa. In fact, this entire juz uh, of the fifth juz is taken up by uh, the verses of Surah An-Nisa, chapter, uh, chapter pertaining to women. So the first discussion in here is a continuation of the last discussion from the fourth juz, which is of who you can marry and who you cannot marry. So in detail, the discussion was about those women that men are not allowed to marry, and then you'd look at the same thing the other way around when it comes to women marrying men. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is what's prescribed upon you, and anything beyond what we've mentioned here, then it's all halal for you to marry those women. But a few things that, that are mentioned here is that there has to be a mahr, a dowry must be given to show your seriousness. There's a marriage payment that must be provided. Now, from some of these verses, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The literal translation there about is that whoever you take benefit from, whoever you enjoy as husband and wife, among them, then give them, their, give them their payment as an obligation. Now, some people have tried, and this is obviously incorrect, but some people have tried to justify and support the idea of muta'a. Now, I used the word muta'a the other day, but that was in the, in the sense of giving a divorced, your, your, your divorced wife a gift. So, a wife who, there I, I didn't go into it in too much detail, but if your wife, uh, if you had been married to somebody and had not consummated, had not gotten together with her, just married, and also you did not decide on stipulate a mahar, a marriage payment. So it was just a quick uh, nikah, solemnization, and you did not get together, then because there was no mahar there, you still have to give a muta'a wujuban, like necessarily. And any other wife, even if you paid her the mahar and so on, as I mentioned last time, you have to give them a muta'a, which in that case just meant a gift, generally a suit or something like that. Here the concept of muta'a is different because the word muta'a means an enjoyment, something to enjoy. So here the idea of muta'a is that you, a man comes to a woman and says, I will marry you temporarily. So essentially the concept of muta'a is a temporary marriage, two days, two hours, right? Essentially another word for prostitution. This happens in some countries, there was a BBC documentary about it happening in Iraq. Because under the Shia, Shi'i school of thought, this has, some, this has some validity and maybe even virtue, right, based on their understanding of this. But in Islam, while this may have been permitted earlier on, there was a, early on in Islam it may have been permitted, but after that, there's a very clear narration from Ibn Majah, etc., that uh, while this may have been done in the beginning, meaning there was permission at the beginning, but now since then, uh, until Qiyamah, this has become prohibited, so in the, in the Sunni school, the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, this is completely prohibited. 
it's huge abuse that, as the BBC commentary showed, a BBC documentary, not that everything the BBC shows is good, but it just showed the abuse that was taking place in that case. So this is not a verse that you can justify the concept of mut'a or temporary marriages as such with that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then discusses several other things here. Number one, there's a discussion there's, uh, from verse 26 onwards, three, uh, three verses. They're very, they're very profound. Yuridullahu liyubayyina lakum. After mentioning all of these things, Allah says, Allah wants to make this clear to you. Allah wants to provide you this exposition. And He wants to guide you. Guide you to the ways of those before you. And then He wants to forgive you. He wants to accept your repentance if you do anything wrong. And Allah is knowing and the wise one. Then Allah says, Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum. Allah wants to accept your, your repentance. While those people who follow their desires, they would rather that you basically completely, uh, you completely incline away from the faith. So there's always people out there, and you'll see that in different colors. And as we go along, I'm going to explain some of that today. Inshallah, that there's a lot of people who want people to do wrong because it just makes them feel better. It validates their understanding, it validates their practice, it validates their abandonment of something. And that's always going to be the case. So don't come under their pressure. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ Allah wants to lighten the burden upon you. Right? Allah wants to lighten it upon you. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا Because humans, the insan, has been created weak. That's a declaration of Allah who created us, our creator. One of the tabi'een, his explanation here was that when a man sees a woman, he, can't, he, he has a tough time basically controlling his gaze and managing the situation. Um, not having sticky eyes, which in Ramadan is a, definitely, a, 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 you know, it becomes easier for a lot of people, as they say. But that's the explanation here that the human has been created weak, that he knows he can't have something. Everybody you see, you can't have. Maybe you can have maximum up to four according to the permission, but you can't. But every new person they see, they want to look. It's this natural desire which is part of our weakness, part of the fitna, part of the grand scale of the, 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 the environment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to put us in and wants us to avoid and see if we love Allah more by, uh, by abandoning the stare, the surreptitious look, and by following the command of Allah. And may Allah make that easy for men. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these are several different miscellaneous issues that Allah brings up here. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la ta'kulu amwalakum baynakum bil batil. Verse 29, uh, o oh people who believe, do not consume your wealth between you in an unjust fashion. Unless it's a tijara that you're going to do straight away. Tijara is allowed, but you can't consume wealth for one another. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا So, several, وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ عُدْوَانًا وَذُلْمًا فَسَوْفَ نُسْلِيهِ نَارًا وَكَانَ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرًا Then, the next verse is 31. إِنْ تَجْتَنِبُوا كَبَائِرَ مَا تُنْهَوْنَ عَنْهَ Extremely promising and very comforting. Because what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if you avoid the major sins, those that you've been prohibited from, that you've been warned against, the major ones, then your other smaller deeds and so on, your smaller sins and so on that you may commit uh, randomly, just like that, uh, inadvertently maybe, they, we can easily expiate for them. We can easily remove them. Make a major effort to avoid the big sins. May, may, may make a big effort to avoid the major sins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also forgive our minor sins that we don't even realize sometimes that we may be doing. And we will enter you into a noble place. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 32, this is just to manage our expectations in the world because the way the world is made up, the way humanity is distributed, is that you're going to have a spectrum of people. You're going to have the very, very, very wealthy, the filthy rich, the, I don't know how many percentage it is that own half the wealth of the world. Then in any, every community, then you're going to have the, the, the quite wealthy, then you're going to have those that are doing well, 
those that are just getting by, those that are struggling to get by, and those who have absolutely nothing, and those who are literally dying of hunger. So you've got a spectrum all, all the time. Now everybody, just like when it comes to knowledge and things, there's always going to be something someone else will have. Even the wealthiest person, there's going to be something that someone else has, and he's going to look, and he's going to get attracted by that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that it doesn't matter where you are, do not look at those above you. Because when you look at those above you, it encourages you. I mean, I've got two watches which I've had for about 15 to 20 years, 10 to 20 years, and they both work, right? They've lost their waterproofing, but they work, and I can't justify buying another one because I think it's a waste. They're still working. They're giving me the time. But just a few years ago, I remember this very vividly. There was another scholar who would come. He had a really nice Rada watch, a really nice thin one. And I looked at it and I was like, I should get one of those, right? Until then, because there's always going to be something that will... Catch your fancy. Right? There's always something. That's the dunya. That's our in attraction to the world. So Allah says, Wala tatamannaw ma faddalallahu bihi ba'dakum ala ba'd. Do not desire that which we've given additionally as grace to some over the other. And this could be numerous things. This could be men to women, women to men. Because Allah then says, لِلْرِجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِّمَّا اكْتَسَبُ وَلِلْنِسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِّمَّا اكْتَسَبُ Men are going to basically account for their own deeds and women are going to account for their own deeds. So if there's something given to women that men would love and say, don't look at that and feel bad about it. And likewise, if there's something that men have that women do not have, then don't feel like I must have that as well. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that each one of you is going to be judged according to whatever you have been, whatever you earn. Min you can ask for Allah's grace. In Allah bi kulli shayin alima. Then after that, from this, uh, from uh, verse 34, starts the discussion about male and female interaction, uh, husband and wife interaction, and basically just the nature of men and women in general, which we don't have to, which we don't have the time to go into in depth. Otherwise, it's a very profound verse that everybody should read and understand. And unfortunately, there's aspects of this are, that are misunderstood, misapplied, and because of that, it brings. Uh, a lot of abuse. So that is الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض. Men are the قوامون. That's how I'm going to translate it. Upon women, or for women, because of the grace that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has provided some over the other, and because they spend upon them from their wealth. So men have been given a certain authority, a certain in charge, certain responsibility. Let's call it. Right? So the, in, an, in a family paradigm in Islam, the man is the head of the household. And I don't mean head of the household in the sense that he has to come in, sit on a throne, right? the special armchair or the special massage chair right? that costs a thousand pounds or whatever. And then he just basically says, okay, bring me this, bring me that, and gets very angry if they don't. He's not supposed to be a dictator. That's not the idea. The idea is that he's in charge, meaning he is responsible. So anything goes wrong in the family, he is in charge. If there's no tarbiyah and he doesn't discipline, uh, train the people, train uh, the, the children properly, he is going to be, his neck is going to be grabbed on the day of judgment. That's, that's very important to understand. It's a responsibility. It's not some position to enjoy an abuse and take advantage of like that. You can take advantage of in the right way that, okay, I am the, made the head of the household, so Allah has given me a very important mission, a very important role to play, and I want to do this properly. And the best person to understand this from is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa who at one time had nine wives and children, and the way he dealt with them. So that's the discussion, that that is the idea. And because they spend upon them, that's a very important characteristic that men are the ones who are in charge. Subhanallah. You get stories of men forcing their wives to go and work and they don't. They get a menial job. They, don't, they sit at home and just say they're on the stock market, right? And uh, they're not really doing much in the stock market. And they're getting their wives to have a stable job. In fact, I was once, uh, a woman called and uh, said that she's a niqabi. She, she covers her face. The husband says he can't find a so-called halal job in which there's no male-female interaction. So he forced her to go out to work. Is, is like get your priorities right. So the man's responsibility is that he is in charge in making sure all the affairs, 
are taken care of. That doesn't mean that the mother is not in charge at all, that the wife is not in She can be in charge of, you can, desig you can delegate tasks, you can designate various different areas. And in many houses, it works very well. Likewise, Fatima radiallahu anha and Ali radiallahu anha, one of the best couples in Islam, they, they had a very, very nice distribution of Ali radiallahu anha being in charge of everything outside and bringing in the money. And Fatima radiallahu anha was in charge of everything inside. And of course, you're going to have to make amends if you want a lot from the outside, then the wife may have to take part. And if you want a lot more inside, then the man is going to have to take part in that as well. You can't expect more beyond kind of the, the, the average and then expect not to take part and, and, and make it burdensome. For example, a man in forcing that his wife must also work full time while he does, and then she also has to do everything else that's inside the house. Uh, but the main thing is that they must spend. That's why you get a big imbalance when the wife is bringing in the money and the husband is not bringing in any money, he's not contributing, and thus it creates a huge emotional imbalance. Psychological imbalance. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the case of discipline, which is a really controversial, so called controversial verse, as some people like to make it. Because if you look at 20 different Quran translations, for the third aspect in here, you're going to see different translations. Basically, the idea here is that if there is some tyranny from the wife, because the husband's supposed to be in charge to make sure it's all right. As I said, you know, we must be careful because unfortunately, some husbands are like the oldest son for the wife. They have to look after him like the oldest son, unfortunately, which is really messing up the whole role there. And then they expect to still be the man of the house. So the idea here is that if a wife is acting tyrannically and she's not fulfilling her side of the bargain and basically uh, trying to overcome uh, uh, where, where the husband's responsibilities are, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides a method for discipline. So listen to this very carefully. I'm going to say it in brief only. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاللَّاتِي تَخَافُونَ نُشُوزَهُنَّ Verse 34, فَعِذُوهُنَّ Your first job is to give them advice. Maybe they just forgotten. Maybe they don't realize in so many husband-wife situations you have it where one, per one couple uh, or one partner is doing something but is not realizing the impact it's having on the other. We get this all the time. When you tell them, alhamdulillah, they wake up and they understand, they get consciousness. Sometimes we have men and women who tell others to, uh, they expect the other to be doing a certain thing but they don't, they don't tell them and then they just have this gripe inside until one day they blow up. And that's not the right way to do things. You need to have an open conversation and an open relationship where you mention these things. So Allah says first, فَعِذُوهُنَّ First, give advice. وَهْجُرُوهُنَّ Second, if that doesn't work, then the second way to show your displeasure is to stay away in bed. So do not sleep together. Which means go away, sleep somewhere else. Don't push her out of the bed. You go and sleep somewhere to show your displeasure. Hopefully that should sort it out. In most cases, one and two, more than enough. Then it says, if that doesn't work, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, after that strike, hit. Now, the word hit and strike, you have to be careful about that. I, I, uh, the, the word beat is, a, a lot of people do the translation, beat her. If you look at a dictionary definition of beat, it means to to strike somebody with the intention of wounding. And that definitely is not what is meant here. One of the best people we're going to go to look for the tafsir of this. Uh, for example, as tafsir, our, one of our earliest published tafsirs tell us, which is tafsir of Tabari, he relates directly with his chain to Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. The meaning of this is that with something like a, a tooth stick, a miswak, like a straw, literally like a straw, just to show displeasure. It's not to wound or anything like that. That is what the Quran is saying here. However, the Prophet Sallallahu his sunnah, right, was to never hit. And that is what I follow. And that is what I encourage, is that you never hit. In fact, when I get calls of women who call and say, I'm getting beaten up, I say, go to the police straight away. It's a very difficult thing to, for them to do that because there's so much family and that involved that how can I go? But really, unless you take a strong stance, things don't generally change because it's generally hereditary. Right? Somebody called me once and said, I beat my wife, I knew this guy. Like, Why did he hit his wife? He, I don't think he ever did it again afterwards because he was shocked. And uh, I think the reason he did it at that time was probably because he'd, he'd been married newly and he'd probably seen his parents do it, his father do it. 
A lot of the time it's hereditary. You don't need to do it. You don't need to do it. And a lot of people who actually do hit their wives, they do not do it this way. Even though they might be saying it's in the Quran that you can do that, they do not advise them. Oh, I've advised them for the last 20 years. You've been beating them up for 20 years. Right? That's, what, that's, what, that's the idea. And then separating from the bed. They would never do that. In fact, they'd make sure they're in bed and they... Subhanallah. Right? Anyway, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ شِقَاكَ بَيْنِهِمَا Now sometimes relationships are irretrievably um, broken down and they just, you can't just see it. Unfortunately, you have some cultures where you must stay together. It's like Catholic culture in Islam almost, which is completely wrong. It's only the Catholics that kind of insist that you must stay together till death. Till death do we not part or something like that. In Islam, it's allowed, but we do have some cultures where, no, you have to live together and stay together even if it's irretrievably broken down. They're sleeping in separate rooms. They don't see one another. I had a case like that. A guy saying, literally, I'm just having to stay together for numerous economic children, other reasons. And they live in separate rooms. But he goes, when I see her in the passage, and it was actually before last Ramadan. He says, in Ramadan is coming, I want to be particular. Can, do I have to say salam to her? Do I have to say anything to her? Because it, it, it was a very unique situation. So in Islam, it's allowed. That, uh, first, the first step, though, here is that if you do uh, fear a dispute between them and such separation like that, then send, send uh, an arbiter from each side so that they can go and try to solve the issue. Get the family involved. Get an arbiter involved, somebody who can uh, stand in for the man. So, because sometimes they don't even want to speak to one another. There's so much suspicion. There is just so much mistrust, distrust, that it doesn't work. That's why you need somebody else to step in and just change the whole game. That's the way sometimes in yurida islahan yuwafiqillahu baynahuma if they do want reform then Allah will provide that uh, tawfiq and that reconciliation between them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most knowing and uh, Allah is uh, is all all aware and all knowing Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a kind of a round up wa'budullah worship Allah in verse 36 worship Allah do not ascribe any partners to him and then deal excellently. Show excellent behavior to your parents, to your relatives, to the orphans, to the miskeen, basically the, the needy people, and your neighbors. In Islam, neighbors are very important. Now, neighbors are of three categories, and the higher the category, the more your responsibility towards that neighbor. Because generally, in most communities, until our modern metropolis and our modern uh, global world, most people lived among their family members. They lived in their village, their area of the town or city. And everybody lived there. You, you got a job or close by or you had your own fields or your own business or something. But in this new globalized world where everybody's trying to say, in America, there's very few families, for example, in North America, very few families that are all together, as in all the siblings are together. One brother's in New York, another one's in Texas, and the other one is in San Jose, you know, California. The only time they actually get together is on Thanksgiving, Right? Alhamdulillah, in England, it's not that bad, right? And then England is not that big either, so you can easily get together, right? But still, I think our families are closer together in the UK and as in other places. But generally, that was the case. So now, if your neighbor is just a neighbor, he's not related to you and he's not a Muslim, you still ha still has a right. As being a neighbor, you live together. The first person to understand something is going to go in your house is going to be your neighbor, so you can see that there's a practical advantage there as well, that you must be good to one another. And believe me, to have a bad neighbor that you're on bad terms with, subhanallah. He's saying that if you're a Bedouin and you have a bad neighbor in the tent next to you, that's fine. Because the neighbor in the Badia, yatahawwal, you're going to move around because you're nomads, you move around. But when you're in Hadar, when you're in a fixed place, can you imagine for the next 30, 40, 50 years, you don't want to sell up, they don't want to sell up. So you must have good relationship with them, give them things, just ask behind them, don't bother them, and so on. If they're also now a Muslim, that's two rights. Practically as well, because there's going to be Eid that you're going to be celebrating together. right? There's going to be other, other things that you're going to share from a religious perspective, so there's going to be more rights there. And number three is if they're also related to you, which in many cases your neighbor is generally your brother or somebody, now you've got three rights. Neighbor, Muslim, and your relative. So you have to do that much more. 
It's all pra a lot of practical considerations in that case. And the hukum in Islam about neighbors is such that we've, all, we, we've got it to such a level that the Prophet ﷺ said that do not even enter certain things in your house right, without giving them because if they're children. For example, if you're giving your children ice cream to eat and they're outside and your neighbor's, guys, uh, neighbor's children are playing outside and you only give your children ice cream and not them, that's probably one of the worst persecutions you can do. Right? Can you imagine a child without ice cream and he watches everybody else eating ice cream? That's just a no-no. If you want to do it, give them to him in the house. Make sure they eat them in the house so that the neighbor doesn't see. The neighbor's children do not see. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then continues discussion about spending in the path of Allah. That keeps coming up because that's again a very important aspect of Islam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings some issues relating to the Bani Israel. And especially at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the deception that was used by them and the untruths that they would say, the lying that they would, the, the, you know, the, the, the lies that they would tell. And um, that, that's discussed there, told them that be careful about all of this. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah forgives everything. In Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bi wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika li man yasha, which is verse 48. Allah forgives everything except shirk and ascription. Then there's a number of other warnings with regards to your enemies and uh, the, the non-Muslims of the time that used to cause a lot of enmity and a lot of opposition. It was a, quite a tough time at that, at that time because there was clear demarcation that you are someone else. There was, there was no in-between in that case. Now, Islam is uh, the religion of uh, justice and fairness and equality and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Allah ya'murukum in this verse 58 and 59 which are basically considered the verses of adl the verses of justice right uh, of course the one of the biggest declarations of justice in the Quran is in surah al-rahman wa wada al mizan Allah placed the scale Everything is within a balance in the world and anybody upsets that is abusing it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you that you basically fulfill your trusts. Anything which is entrusted to you, you must fulfill it in the right way. Whoever that is, trust to your wife, trust to your husband, trust to your children, trust to your community. Trust to humanity, trust to Allah, trust to the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَن تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ Whenever you do have to make uh, a decision among people, whenever you have to judge between people, it doesn't mean like you sit as a judge, but in any kind of situation where you are made to judge between, let not your family ties, let not your business relationships, let not anything else come in the way, but be just. Those people will always be remembered forever. Those people will always be remembered who are just regardless of what comes in between. Inna Allah ni'imma ya'idhukum. This is a big issue that Allah is advising you about. Allah is all hearing and all seeing. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul wa ulil amri minkum. The next verse, 59. O people who believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and obey those in authority over you. I mean, imagine it. If you, your employer has the authority over you, you, if you're part of a committee, the head has authority over you. The, the leader of your, your place, your country, whatever, has authority over you. You're supposed to obey them in anything in which they're not being abusive, at least. Right? Otherwise, you protest and you do the right thing. Right? But otherwise, wherever it's right, you have to obey. That is basically a rule for social uh, for, for social consistency, for social harmony. So it's just not that you do worship, but you also have to make sure that you obey those who are above you in certain positions. Allah has given them that position, and there's a reason that we need to maintain the harmony. Now, from verse 60, there's a... أَلَمْ تَرَى إِلَى الَّذِينَ يَزْعُمُونَ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ There's a... This came down because of a specific incident. A very interesting incident that's very telling. What exactly happened here is that, as I said, the whole discussion is that Islam talks about fairness and balance. It doesn't matter who it is. So if there's a case of a Muslim against a non-Muslim and the Muslim is in the wrong, then you would have to judge for the non-Muslim. 
And that's exactly what happened here. Uthman ibn Talha, there's a famous story about Uthman ibn Talha. He was, uh, they were in charge, that family, and especially Uthman ibn Talha was in charge of the key of the Kaaba. That's a very presti prestigious position. So one family was in, in charge of the water, another was in charge of uh, the, the, the Hujjaj, and the, uh, one was in charge of the key. So he was not a Muslim at the conquest, uh, at the taking of Makkah, he was not a Muslim. So initially they'd taken the key away from him. Right, some of the soldiers, some of the uh, Muslims had taken the key of, uh, away from him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, give it back to him. That's their right. Give it to them. And subhanallah, seeing this justice, the uh, Uthman uh, radiallahu anhu became a Muslim. Right, he became a Muslim. And uh, there's another story here, which is that there was a, a name Muslim, Muslim by name, a munafiq essentially, right, a hypocrite. He had a case against a Jewish person, right? A Jew of Medina Munawwara. And they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with their case. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with his justice, he ruled in favor of the, the Jewish person, right? Not because this guy was a munafiq or something, but because the truth was with the Jewish person. This guy claimed to be a Muslim, but the other one was a Jewish person. He, he, he gave him, it was his right. Now, this obviously start, he started creating a big issue because the Munafiqin would use any, anything to create rumors and so on. Now, now, what actually happened is this Munafiq then goes to Umar radiallahu's house. And he says to Umar radiallahu, I want you to judge between us. I've got a case. Umar radiallahu who does not know that the Prophet has already made a judgment. So he says, okay, what is the case? What is the story? So he says, he was about to tell him when the Jewish person said, Ya Umar, the Prophet ﷺ has already judged between us in my favor. So Umar said, okay, wait. He went into his house, he was outside, he went into his house, brought a sword and basically finished the guy off. Not the Jew, the Munafiq, the, the, the one who called himself a Muslim. And first you think it was just kind of a haphazard, arbitrary. I mean, those days, I mean, taking somebody's head off was not a big deal, to be honest. That doesn't justify it. Right, because there they carried their swords pretty much everywhere. It was they were in constant skirmishes and so on. Life was cheap in many cases. Islam came to do away with that. The justification here, I remember when I first read it, I was like, "How do you do that?" The justification here is that the this person, according to Islam, anybody who goes against the Prophet command, especially in front of him like that, that means he's apostatized, and an apostasy has. The, you know, uh, ha has the penalty of being killed. So that's exactly what Umar did in that case. This is not something you do at home here. All right? This is something that was done in Medina Munawa in a very particular way. And Umar knew what he was talking about. So now because of that, they started causing a lot of problems. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now mentions a number of verses uh, from, 15, from 60 and onwards that discuss this, um, that discuss all of these, uh, all of these things. And uh, the, main, the main point in all of this is فَلَا وَرَبِّكْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا That no, by your Lord, they cannot be true believers until they make you the judge in what they dispute among them. And then once you've made the judgment, they do not find any problem with that. They have no reservations about your judgment about, what, about the judgment you made, and they fully submit. They fully submit. Uh, but this was the problem with the Munafiqeen. They were the additional, you know, one was to have non-Muslims who were against you. Then it was those that, who were actually non-Muslim inside, but they showed themselves to be Muslims outside. They were even a bigger problem. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about that. وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ Now this is one of the wonderful verses, which is actually a tafsir of a part of Surah Al-Fatiha. Right, tafsir of the Quran with the Quran, which is verse uh, 69. That uh, those, uh, the one who obeys Allah and His Messenger, they are the ones who will then be with those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showered His blessings upon. An'amta alayhim, those. Ma'alladina an'am Allahu alayhim, the prophets, Siddiqeen, the champions of truth, wa shuhada, the martyrs, and the salihin, the righteous ones, wa hasuna ula'ika rafiqa. And what a beautiful company and friends these are. May Allah make us among them. Now the next discussion is all about jihad and preparation for jihad. Remember, 
Islam was an entity. It was an entity of rule, right? Their whole rule was according to Islam. So within that, the whole concept of defense, the whole concept of uh, fighting, the whole concept of uh, preparation for that, being on preparation and all that, had to be part of the system, right? And that's what it is. Now, that's why we find it so difficult in the West, which has its own laws, right? And who sometimes use so-called mujahideen when it suits them, like they did in Bosnia, right? In, in the Bosnian wars, uh, the Balkan wars. But then after that, they're, they're, they're fearful because some people do, do some crazy things. They get a bit... Uh, misunderstanding of that Of how and real jihad is That's why I mentioned before as well That this is something that we're going to have to work out Because the Quran is just replete with this And if it can help humanity in the right way Then that's an important idea That needs to be discussed openly right? Because otherwise it creates a major conundrum In, in, in the minds of Muslims and non-Muslims So that's why uh, we, need clar we, we need to provide some clarity uh, for this in uh, work on some clarity for this in the West inshallah but numerous this kind of the idea is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that look at the end of the day when you need to defend yourself when you need to undertake certain battles for good reasons then if you're going to be killed in it it's because Allah has written it to be so if Allah had written for you to be killed for you to die you would die on your on your bed you would die at home you die in your field you die doing something that would not have been considered to be Dangerous. So at the end of the day, your death, your life is written in the hands of Allah. But where there's a just war, then you need to take part in it in the right way when there's a call for it. Uh, so all of this discussion is there. And uh, discussing how the munafiqeen would try to mislead and say, no, don't go. They would try to demoralize. On numerous occasions, they would actually go out with them as a contingent. And when they've gone like half the way, they would retreat. That would demoralize everybody else that, hey, we've already lost 25% of our people or 10% of our people. Because Allah says in verse 78, uh, Right? Another very clear cut idea about death wherever you are, wherever you be, wherever you will be, death is going to catch up with you, even if you are in these lofty towers. Nobody has access. You need a special crane to take you up there so nobody can come and kill you there but death will even come there right where no other man can reach and you're the only person even on the moon or wherever it is and that's why then saying that whenever something good happens then people say okay this is from Allah and uh, everything is from Allah whether it's good or bad everything Allah is in but Whatever good does come to you, then understand that Allah wants to favor you. Whatever, there seems to be, like some people might say, there's a contradiction between verse 78 and 79, so I'm just clarifying. In the first one, Allah is just saying that everything comes from Allah. Whether it's good or bad, it's all under Allah's plan, and He's the creator of it. And the second verse is saying that, yes, whenever something good and positive happens to you, then Allah is gifting you something. When something negative and wrong and adversity takes place, then it's because of some sin or some wrong, some blameworthiness that you've committed. So introspect. Yes, it's created by Allah, but it's most likely either punishment or something for what you may have done. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a number of other things. Uh, discussing how... You need to be careful of your enemies plotting against you. They're making plans behind your back. Them openly telling you one thing, and then after that going behind and plotting against you, speaking ill against you, uh, joining up with your enemies, and so on and so forth. You know, this is the situation today as well. Right? And this is very telling for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 88, right? فَمَا لَكُمْ فِي الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِئَتَيْنِ وَاللَّهُ أَرْكَسَهُمْ بِمَا كَسَبُوا أَتُرِيدُونَ أَنْ تَهْدُوا مَنْ أَضَلَّ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ يُدْرِلِ اللَّهِ فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُ سَبِيلًا The existence of the munafiqeen was a very complicated matter. It was very confusing, very challenging. The reason is, you've got people who are calling themselves Muslim. Now, they're not aggressing every day. They're very clever, right? They're hiding their aggression. They're smiling at you, right? Now, for some people who've not felt the brunt of it, they're thinking that these are decent people. 
Why are you aggressing against them? They're our brothers. They're Muslims, they're our brothers. Others who felt it, right, who've experienced it, who know the reality and seen the deception, they want to take some measures. So that's creating a problem. Today that creates the same problem. There's people out there, Islamophobes, or actually Muslim Islamophobes. I mean, you know, what a, what a statement, right? A Muslim Islamophobe in a sense that they will write uh, in, in reports and in the media and so on things that actually go against Islam, but say, I'm a Muslim, um, how can I be against Islam? So this is justified. Most of the time it's to do with changing of laws, liberalization, changing uh, harams into halal and so on. And for a lot of people that creates confusion that he's saying he's a Muslim, so you should call him a Muslim. Now we're not saying call a person kafir here. And of course the situation in Munafiq was different. But Allah makes it very clear. He says, what's the problem? What is wrong with you? That you've become two, you've become two parties with regards to the, the Munafiqeen. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take them to task for what they do. Do you think you can guide basically those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, uh, has allowed to stray? Right? Because anybody that Allah has allowed to stray, you will not find any path for them. They, what do, if Allah is in His Jalal here, in His Majesty, is what do law takfuruna kama kafaru? They just want you to disbelieve just like they disbelieve. Fatakununa sawa, so that you become the same, right? That you're all disbelievers. Don't make any friends among people like that. So that's why there's some. This happens a lot. This happens a lot. That a person who can't do something, like he can't fast in Ramadan, he's going to try to justify to others why fasting is not necessary. Because it just makes them feel a bit better. One thing good is that at least they seem to have one foot still in Islam. So like they want to be. Another one is, I don't wear hijab, right? But hijab is not necessary. Why do you have to wear it for? Why do you insist on that? Of course it's necessary. It's one of the orthodox substratum of beliefs. There's no question, it's an axiomatic belief of Islam. The hijab, you don't even need evidence for it. To ask for evidence, clear cut. Just like salat is. But no, you've got people who say that just so that it makes them feel better. Wallahu alam. I mean, this is psychological. You know, they feel better. They want to justify a lot of other things. That's why the way I look at it, right? The simplest advice, the best advice I've seen is that, look, we are not perfect. Right? Fattaqullaha mastata'tum. Fear Allah as much as you can. Right? To our best ability, if today I cannot wear a hijab, if it's a woman, that's fine. Intend to wear it tomorrow. Know you're doing wrong. Know that you're in, it's a challenge for you. Do it tomorrow. At least leave the door open. If you justify it, I can't pray salat in the masjid. I had a guy who didn't pray Jumu. I said, why not? He's a lovely person. He helped out the masjid and so on. Oh, because uh, I'm very busy. I said, but the Prophet said that three Jumu'ahs you miss uh, while taking them lightly. So don't put that on this COVID time, right? Allah puts a seal on your heart. He said, yeah, that was, the, they were not so busy, the Sahaba, they were like not very busy. I said, like, come on, like, come on, you know? Don't justify. Justification of a wrong is the worst thing that you can do because there's no chance then. Just say, okay, I'm weak right now. I can't do it. Tomorrow I'm going to do it. And Allah will give you tawfiq, inshaAllah. Allah will divinely enable you. So now, uh, if we, when we move on, there's a whole discussion about killing people that you're not allowed to just kill people like that. Subhanallah. Don't misunderstand that from the Quran. Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ أَنْ يَقْتُلَ مُؤْمِنًا إِلَّا خطأ. Right? The only way that one mu'min could end up killing another believer is by mistake. There's no other way to do it. And even if you do that, then you need to free a slave and you need to give a ransom. And there's the whole discussion about what the procedure is, even if you mistakenly kill someone. Right? Then Allah says very strongly, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمُ خَالِدًا فِيهَا That's verse 93 then. Right? The one who kills a believer on purpose, premeditatingly, right, purposefully, then there is nothing for him except Jahannam. Meaning, his tawbah to be accepted is going to be very difficult, but the ulama do, uh, do believe that if he makes a sincere, uh, sincere tawbah, Allah could forgive him. But it's just to show that he is going to be in hellfire for a very, very long time. And Allah is angry upon him, Allah curses him, and Allah has prepared, prepared a mighty punishment for him. That's just not something you do. And subhanallah, you've got people claiming to be the Islamic State, giving themselves that name and killing primarily Muslims. 
right, primarily Muslims, and, and destroying everything. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses, because the war situation, and uh, that requires a special circumstance, how do you pray in that time? How do you pray when you're traveling? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from verse 94 then, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا ضَرَبْتُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَتَبَيَّنُوا وَلَا تَقُولُوا um, well actually, that it carries on. Uh, uh, later, 101, verse 100 is the one more specifically. When you're traveling, it's allowed for you to short, shorten your prayers. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you are traveling, and if you fear the enemy, then you need to take precaution. Now look at this, it's so interesting that because of this circumstance of fear and precaution, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually changed... <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually changed the whole way the prayer is done. Number one is shortened. Number two, if everybody insists that they're going to pray behind their commander or their leader, now how are they going to do that? If everybody starts praying, who's going to defend the front lines? Or who's going to be in the lookout? So Allah says, look at this. It's like the whole salat is distributed. Half the group stand, they're not praying yet. They're outside. They're on the front lines. They're protecting. The other half start the salat with the imam. Imam does, let's say it's a Fajr prayer, so two rakats, right? He does one rak'ah with, with these guys. They literally, in their prayer, after they finish the first rak'ah of sujood, they move away and they go to the front lines. It's as if they're still in prayer, right? The second group come and they join in with the Imam. So it's their first rak'ah, the Imam's second. The Imam finishes off. They, after the Imam finishes, they go back to the front line. The other ones come back and they finish their prayer. Basically, the idea is that they both get to pray behind the imam who they want, both want to pray with. Of course, if they're happy to pray behind two separate imams at separate times, that's fine as well. So the whole salat is split up because of the importance of this factor and the importance of preparedness. So that even when you're, when you're praying, then make sure that you have your weapons close by. وَخُذُوا hidrakum, As in verse 102 and so on. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to a slightly different theme, which is from verse 105. Uh, 105, yes. Inna anzalna ilayk al kitab. We've revealed this book to you with the truth so that you can basically use it uh, to judge between people because it provides the criterion of right and wrong. Now, what happened here is that this is another story. Just, just one thing that uh, I forgot to mention related to uh, that I missed out actually on verse 100. Which is وَمَنْ يُهَاجِرْ فِي سَبِيلَ The concept of hijrah is part of the migration Because sometimes if, you, if it's just unbearable And you can't practice your deen somewhere Then migration is the option for you Right? Sometimes it even becomes necessary So now what happens is People are migrating from Makkah Mukarramah to Medina Munawwara Because there's persecution So there's a sahabi who's very old Very sick His name is Hamza ibn Qais radiyallahu an Sayyidina Hamza ibn Qais radiyallahu an now, he sees this verse, he sees the virtues and, and everything else, and he feels like, I can't travel to Medina Munawar, I can't migrate, I don't have the energy. So what does he do? And this shows that when you can't do something, you do the best that you can, and Allah will accept. That's the intention of the believer. So what he does, well, he tells his children, put me on a bed, put me on a platform, put me on a bed, and carry me towards Medina Munawar. As soon as they left Makkah Mukarramah, not a night had passed when he passed away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يُهَاجِرْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ يَجِدْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُرَاغَمًا كَثِيرًا وَسَعَةً وَمَنْ يَخْرُجْ مِنْ بَيْتِهِ مُهَاجِرًا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ This part of verse 100, whoever leaves his house, migrating to Allah and his messenger, ثُمَّ يُدْرِكُ الْمَوْتِ But then death catches up with him before he gets there. فَقَدْ وَقَعَ أَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ His reward is binding upon Allah. Allah will give him his reward. That's why I say that even your qada prayers or anything else, as long as you've started and you're doing your best, Allah, inshallah, will forgive the rest and will give you the reward for it. And Allah is all forgiving and all merciful. Now, uh, uh, another story here, which is related to further on to verse 100. And all of this discussion is then about munafiqeen and, uh, and all of that until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yes. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ بِالْحَقِّ لِتَحْكُمَ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِمَا أَرَاكَ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَكُلْ لِلْخَائِنِينَ خَصِيمًا The one I read earlier, 105. What happened here is, there was another case of a Jewish person and a munafiq. Uh, a Muslim, uh, outwardly Muslim person. Now, what happened is, that this person, 
and his family, they were very influential and they came and kind of tried to convince the Prophet Sallallahu that they were in the right, whereas right was the other side. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, he had no wahi had come to him and just from the face of it, felt that they may have been more on the right, so he was going to incline in that direction. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala corrects this, reveals this verse. And look what Allah says, look at the words. That we have revealed the book to you with the truth so that you can... Uh, judge between people according to what Allah shows you do not ever be a proponent for the deceivers for those who do not keep their trust wastaghfirillah Allah is telling the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and seek forgiveness for this this has gone down in history in the quran to show that justice is so important even the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he didn't know the situation and he was about to, he, he, he was going to go on that, he felt like he was going on that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear. But then Allah immediately says, Inna Allah kana ghafoorur rahim. You don't make a mistake, Allah is always forgiving. وَلَا تُجَادِلْ عَنِ الَّذِينَ يَخْتَانُونَ أَنفُسَهُمْ And do not argue on behalf of those who uh, basically uh, deceive themselves as well. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like those who are deceivers. Now what's interesting is that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then made a judgment for the, for, for the Jewish person, against that so-called Muslim person, he then ran away. I mean, it was now clear that he had caused the problem. So then he secretly ran away to Makkah Mukarramah and that's where he openly became an apostate. He openly became an apostate. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says that inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih Allah does not forgive that anybody ascribe partners to him And he forgives everything else Basically speaking about that person Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a number of verses here Which discusses the shaitan's problem So shaitan is there again saying uh, Allah says And shaitan is promising that I'm going to take a lot of people with me There's a portion of people that I'm going to mislead them Wala udillannahum, I'm gonna mislead them. Wala umanniyannahum, I'm gonna give them a lot of hopes. And that's, you know, that one of our biggest failings is when we're just hoping for more than we can basically deal with or hoping what's haram. Wala amurannahum, and I'm gonna command them in a very, a very particular way. Fala yubatikunna adhan al an'am. They're gonna actually disfigure uh, the, the, the ears of, uh, of animals. This is to show that they're going to do some cruelty to animals or change them. Today, people are doing more than that. They're changing bodies. They're mutilating bodies. They're changing, um, they're, 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 they're changing uh, men to women and women to men. I mean, there's a lot going on today, right? Because all of that is possible now, according to the medical community. I mean, it's not a full change generally. It's, uh, they, they, uh, they have to keep taking hormones. And I'm going to order them. They're going to change the creation of Allah. Right, very relevant verse. Um, but whoever takes shaitan as a wali, as a friend, uh, besides Allah, or uh, leaving out Allah, then they've, they're in full loss. And that's verse 119. He's going to constantly try to promise you things and uh, give you different desires and hopes and so on. But uh, the shaitan is only giving you deception. These people, their ending is in the hellfire. Then to finish off, the one, there's two last themes left, starting from where which is uh, verse 127. They ask you about women. I mean, remember, this is the chapter of women, right? So there's a discussion about women that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a fatwa about them. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging uh, good behavior with women again, but then is also saying that if you want and you can't reconcile together, then it's okay for you to uh, agree to something. sulh, khair, right? But for you to be excellent in your behavior and you fear Allah, then that is what's most important. Again, the reiteration that do not be unjust and unfair when you have more than one wife. You will not be able to be just between women, even if you try your best. So some people are trying to use this verse today to say that that means that more than one wife is disallowed completely. That's what Allah is trying to say, they say. But that's not true. It's just saying that, look, you always have to be suspicious because it's going to be always a conundrum for you. 
right? When you have more than one wife, you may just incline more to the one to the other. Now, what what you can't help, then maybe Allah will forgive you. But فَلَا تَمِيلُوا كُلَّ الْمَيْلِ One thing you do not want to do is that you fully incline to one. فَتَذَرُوهَا كَالْمُعَلَّقَةَ And you basically leave the other one completely suspended. Right? وَإِن تُسْلِي وَتَتَقُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا And this is the best verse. Keep this in mind for all of those who have a problem and know that divorce is the right thing in that case, but are not divorcing, they're persecuting their wives and not letting them go. And it's been two years, they've not seen each other, three years even, and more. Allah says this, and I, when I tell people this, it just makes a lot of sense. Allah says, وَإِن يَتَفَرَّقَ يُغْنِ اللَّهُ كُلَّ مِنْ سَعَتِهِ If the husband and wife do have to separate, fine. Allah says, Allah will enrich each one of them from his broadness. And Allah is wasi and hakim. And believe me, when people eventually do let go, because there's a huge psychological conundrum that takes place in there. It's not easy for a lot of people. But if you do eventually let go for the right reason, Allah will enrich you both. And we've seen that in so many cases. But you have to let go. And you have to have trust in Allah. So when we get to Surah Al-Talaq, you'll see more that there's the three verses of taqwa there relate, uh, when it talks about divorce. But all the women out there who are still holding grudges, men who are persecuting their wives like that, and women who've been divorced now and not allowing their husbands, to their fathers to see the children, the malicious parent syndrome, you need to look at this verse. If you want to be open and you want vastness from Allah, then you need to let it go. You need to let it go and do what's in the best. Now, the last verses then is again uh, in verse 135. It's about standing up for justice. The theme is just over and over again. But then finally, the last discussion is again about the munafiqeen. Two pages, right from verse 138 to the end of the chapter is all about munafiqeen. And um, in the midst of all of that, Ibrahim salam's mention comes in there that his way is the best. I mean, Ibrahim salam constantly comes up, right, his, his discussion. But anyway, the final discussion here is, وَبَشِّرِ الْمُنَافِقِينَ بِأَنَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا Verse 138, give glad tidings to the munafiqeen that for them is a severe punishment. It's kind of a sarcastic tone. Give glad tidings to them. Like, give them the tidings. And... In the munafiqeen, Allah, the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they think that they're deceiving Allah. Whereas wahuwa khadi'uhum is he's really deceiving them because everything is in his control. And when they stand for prayer, because they had to show that they were Muslims, so they would come to the prayer, subhanAllah. Right? They would actually come to the prayer but lounge around. Qamu kusala. They would actually stand around lazily. Yura'un nas just to show people. Because there, if you didn't come to the masjid, you were probably a munafiq. Like, why wouldn't you come to the masjid in those days? Right? Today, that's a, such a difficult task for us. I'm not saying today in COVID times, but even in general times. And, uh, they, they hardly remember Allah. And they're poor guys. They're sometimes this side, sometimes they're on this side. And like, should we believe? No, we shouldn't. I mean, these people were not necessarily all full kafir inside. Some of them were, and they were hiding it. But others, they were like, should we be? Should we not be? They just weren't making up their minds as well. Anyway, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally says, asfali nar, The seven layers of hellfire. Can you believe it? The munafiqeen are the worst of them. They're in the lowest one. And you have to go through all the others to get there. It's like, once you get there, then there's no coming back. Right? Because all the others are lighter as you go up. Because the top one is for the believers who have made, made sins, and if they're going to be punished, it's the top one, it's the lightest one. Then you go down, it gets worse. It gets worse. So they are in the worst of the positions, worse than all other disbelievers as such. But Allah always gives a way out, except those who make tawbah and who reform and who hold on to Allah and who then purify their faith, their deen for Allah. These people are going to be with the believers. And Allah will soon give the believers a huge reward. That's verse 146. And then Allah, uh, the, the, the way this chapter ends, the fifth chapter ends, is beautiful. مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ شَاكِرًا عَلِيمًا What is Allah going to do by punishing you? Like, why should Allah punish you? What does He get out of punishing you? If you are thankful 
and you believe. Just show thanks to Allah. Belief is thanks to Allah that you're recognizing. He gives us everything. We owe everything to Him. That's belief. It's part of it. Just give thanks to Allah and believe. And why would Allah want to punish you? That is so much hope in there that as long as we're doing that, even if we've done something wrong, Allah is saying, why should I punish you? I'm going to give you so many excuses to get out. And the, being the month of Ramadan, this, just ask Him for forgiveness. Just thank Him. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ شَاكِرًا عَلِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really, really values thanks. And He's the all-knowing. Let's just see, um, we've got a few additional points. Uh, firstly, it starts off with some inter-family relationships, as I said. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about not just worship of Allah, but also that you need to be good with your parents and your neighbors and all the other segments of the community. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, especially this is something that you need to go and check the tafsir of. Uh, verse Surah An-Nisa 41 فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَأُولَاءِ شَهِيدًا How the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know, reacted to that verse, right? What, how will it be if we bring from every ummah a witness and then we bring you as, the wit as a witness to all of these people? Um, then there's the discussion, uh, a reminder about not hoping and having these huge ambitions for things that you don't have and that are difficult and that other people have and so on and that works in every sense then the important emphasis on justice in verse 57 in Allah ya'murukum an tu'addu al-amanat and amana one of the amana is tarbiyatul awlad to look after your children is an amana it's not just okay i owe you money so i better give you back no it's not just that it's my amana is that i look after what i've been made responsible for so for my children my wife from a husband's perspective all right? And if you're in a committee of a masjid or MSA, then you're in charge there. It's your responsibility. Allah says you better fulfill that trust and responsibility in anything that you've been given. And uh, following Allah and His Messenger and be totally satisfied with their commandments, even though they might be difficult, you just have to say, I agree with this. Otherwise, you cannot enter into Islam for this. A lot of people are saying, I, can't, I just can't agree with this aspect of Islam. Go and find out more. And maybe it's because you're colored with a different mentality. That's why you, you, you have this issue. And uh, one of the verses which we're doing right now, alhamdulillah, which we're fulfilling right now is verse 82. And again, look at this, 82. Al-Quran. Do they not reflect on the Quran? Do they not reflect on the meaning of the Quran? May Allah accept us for, for this purpose. And they, it, then he says, وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ if it was to have been from other than Allah, لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا They would have found so many discrepancies in there. But when you read the Qur'an, you will not find that. Then the importance of maintaining uh, uh, security and sanctuary, especially between Muslims as well, and the huge punishment for killing Muslims, especially uh, shortening the prayer, change of prayer during a battle and so on. And alhamdulillah. And finally, the discussion was about the munafiqeen. May Allah save us from all the characteristics of nifaq and hypocrisy like lying and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this endeavor. You guys sitting wherever you are in the world, right? And, and listening. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this from all of us to get a better understanding of our deen, our Quran, and to allow it to infuse our hearts and illuminate our hearts and illuminate our life so that we can meet Allah in a better state than we're in. وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين